So I wrote a book on the tools that are in here that I'm covering today, that I covered yesterday, and the front of the book has this. So if you see the lucky boot, the kick-ass melanoma boot, you know you got the right book. And Melody assured me that it, there will be a big splash when it gets to her house for having received the hardbound copies, and you could also have a choice of buying it online. So it's, the, it costs like $13 or a little less than that, and I forgot what it is, $8 or something online. <clears throat> but that all, all that money goes to Cure Insight. I don't get anything out of it. So it was my blessing to be able to write it because when I was going through this, before I had contact with Jack, I was like, this is crazy. And that's what I said about this disease. This is a crash course in being terrified, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I don't know about you folks, but I called and said, I'm having these flashing light, lights. I had said to Yasue, who's a nurse, I got this flashing light and it won't stop. And she thought I'd torn my retina and I called up my doctors and they said, oh no, you come today. You will come today. It was in the middle of December. The next day I was in the retinal specialist. You know how the dance goes. And then you're all of a sudden getting scanned and they're doing this and that. So we're gonna talk about um, how to be able to use techniques that I strongly encourage that you practice before you actually need them. They're all listed. You don't have to worry about writing them down. I also wrote down all the big words. The most important concept I want to get across is on the second page, it's that window of tolerance or arousal. So <clears throat> just pretend that you have a pencil or a pen and just go like this on your window of arousal. It doesn't matter where you start. Just go jagged lines up and down because I'm, I apologize. I don't know how to do that on a computer, so I couldn't do it because I had to email everything to um, Melody. So the window of arousal is the key to understanding how the neurological system works and how to know when you're thinking and feeling at the same time because I want to know that when I'm sitting with my doctor and I'm getting the results of my tests or whatever, I want to be able to hear what he's saying rather than being so frightened that I can't process anything. So how to know. So I'm going to go over the big words first that are listed. The sympathetic nervous system. So if we did a pulse count on me right now, my, my pulse would be probably 85, 90, maybe 100, which is a, is a lot higher because I'm presenting. I've got big lights. I've got all your beautiful eyes looking at me. And I want to do a really good job. So of course, I'm going to be more activated. So when I'm more activated, I am breathing less deeply because I'm doing what I said yesterday about clavicle breathing. Inside, my stomach is like saying, why are you presenting right after lunch? We want to digest the food. So that's when you're really jacked up. That means that my amygdala which is about as big as my little fingernail inside the middle of the brain is trying to take over because my brain is reading physiology that says I'm shallow breathing, my heart rate is rising, I must be in trouble. So there must be something as like a threat towards me. Or I'm shutting down, I'm a couch potato, like what my husband does when he's kind of outside of the window of tolerance, he's a channel surfer. So he's just sitting in the big chair, moving through channels, and I'm like, oh my god, get up. So the people who are channel surfers, couch potatoes, really slowed down, the best thing that you can do is get up and move because you want to be able to get that window of arousal back on that light's moving around. I don't know if, it, if you know that it's right behind you. You're OK. So you can also have what's called um, freeze, which is, which is where the sympathetic nervous system inside is going like this. And the outside, it looks very cool, calm, collect. You've probably had the experience where, well, I don't know where you're from, but in my area, if you're driving at night on a highway at night and a deer comes running out 
in the middle of the night and the headlights shoot at the deer, the deer will stop. You can see the breath going in and out like that. That's that sympathetic nervous system. But the deer is running for its life. It stops, freezes, and looks at your oncoming headlights. Right? Does that make any sense? Is that going to help that deer? No. But I want us to know what that looks like in case you're one of the people where it can get stuck. My neurological system did get stuck when I was so frightened with getting the diagnosis. Because I was like, oh my god. Because my doctor, not the doctors I have at UCSF, the first doctor I had said, quit your practice. You cannot work anymore. I had a full-time private practice. And get your affairs in order. He also sent me to a research institution. And the um, clinical trial had already closed. And we didn't know that. But the institution did. But we had to go anyway. It's like, OK. Not good start. So if, you're, if your line went above the uh, sympathetic nervous system or down below, that means you cannot think and feel at the same time the amygdala has taken over. And you want to be at your whole goal is to get yourself to relax, do something soothing to get your sympathetic nervous system back inside the window of arousal. Or if you are the parasympathetic to Get off the couch, start moving around so that you can think more clearly. Go for a walk. Does this make sense? Is there any part that doesn't make sense? Perfect. You guys are good students. Thank you. <laughs> OK, so I teach this model a lot to law enforcement and fire. They all say, yes, I'm going to practice. I'm going to practice it. They walk out the door, and I'll ask them three weeks later and say, did you practice? So what my job is is to help us know that this is what's going to help us feel better, keep our neurological system calm down so that we're not shooting out cortisol like I am right now, you know. So um, the goal is to get the neurological system into the middle. The trick is, this was the thing that helped convince me. It's not a bad thing if it goes outside of the window, up and down. The trick is learning how to get back inside. So little things, find, realizing what soothes you. So if I went around and you know, just kind of happen chance, popcorn wise, I won't point it at anybody, could you call out loud and say, what soothes you when you're feeling jacked up? Deep breath. Deep breath. Thank you, Yasue. Opening my chest. Opening your chest. Good job, because it expands the lungs. And you're, you will automatically take in more air. Rubbing my temples. Rubbing your temples. Oh, that's a good one. I haven't heard that one. Look up and Getting smile. Getting looks from my husband or children. Getting looks from your husband or your yeah. children? Hugs oh, hugs, yes. Perfect. Look up and smile. Look up and smile. I like that one. Getting the hugs, that whole frontal exposure, really good for us. Anybody else? Stretching. Stretching, yes. Yes. Um, OK, so getting back in, OK, what pushes you out of the window of arousal? What Pain. symptoms or what I Could be symptoms or activities. Me waiting in my doctor's office, waiting, it's, it's all I can do to just keep myself calm. I keep standing up and sitting down. What else? Any? Blood work, a lot, of push, a lot of people get pushed out with the blood work. I have to go like this. Physical pain. Physical pain. Are you getting the Aviston shots? I don't have ocular melanoma. I have other diseases, but I just. Well, physical <laughs> pain. It's the same thing. Physical pain. pain. I mean, it doesn't make any difference what your disease is. True. It's true. What else? I guess I'm huddled in, punching over work, and I realize I'm working too much. You're working too hard. So that's a clue to you. That's that sense of, oh yeah, I'm hunched over. I must be outside of the window of arousal. Appointments, Appointments coming up. The scan the anxiety. Scanning, yeah. yeah, the scan anxiety. Yes? I had to go to clinics for the, for the scans and call it clinic anxiety or clinicitis. But <laughs> that, that's worse than going to the therapy for me, because it's revealing some unknown 
scary monster. Yeah. I can deal with the scary monster of immunotherapy, but it's the, oh, now it's here, and then, oh, now it's here. And, oh. Yeah, that's like, so this is a perfect workshop for you to how to be able to work with that clinicitis. Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> knowing the symptoms, I said yesterday when my voice is getting high-pitched, it's a clue, I'm going out of the window of arousal. Being angry, irritable, frustrated, that's not my norm, so that's letting me know that I'm going out of the window. Um, my energy going too high or too low, you know? I'd, like, I could not do any work on this workshop for the last two weeks before because I am in grief about the campfire. And so I was like, you know what? It's no big deal. They can, they, you all can tolerate me holding on my notes and looking at my notes because it's a reasonable sense of overwhelm. So it's like, like I think I said at lunch, is it really gonna matter in three weeks that I used the notes? No, no. So um, remember about sleep, broken sleep, difficulty getting to sleep. Those are things that are gonna bounce you out of the window. Um, appetite being too low or too high. I keep going over these pointers because what I saw on Facebook was a lot about depression and that people didn't know what depression is, that it's a clinical neurological piece that sometimes people will need medication, sometimes people need a therapist to talk to them or a counselor, or sometimes what works for me is exercise and being with friends, just you know, doing some spiritual stuff. So that's what the window of arousal looks like and that's what the symptoms look like. <clears throat> I don't know where my note went. I, so during the summer, I was waiting for the scans. So I had the scan anxiety and somehow I got it in my head. It was about three weeks before the scans. I got it in my head that I had kind of dissed my neighbor they have a dog, a very big mountain dog that lives next door, and he's a barker, and he barks and barks. And they had a dog before that, too, that did the same thing. And I would call up at 1.30 in the morning, okay, Amy, that's enough. You gotta go down and get your dogs quiet. They have a two-story house. We have a one-story house, so direct alleyway. So I went over, and I took them a big watermelon and a half gallon of uh, French vanilla ice cream. And they were like, why are you bringing us this? And I said, well, I got it in my head. It's, I have my scans next week. I was really worried that I had said something wrong or I gave you a dirty look. And they were like, oh my God, no problem. Do any of you have that sense where, yeah? But what happens? No, it's, yeah. Uh, it's the same thing, disappointment. Did I say too much? I should have handled it differently is what I wind up at. Editing. And it's past already. Yeah. And I'm not letting it go. Yeah. Because I think I think it would be fair to say I think all of us are dependent upon people to help us, and we really don't want to harm our relationships. My biggest bugaboo is I used to be the happy person all the time, and I brought good news, and you know I don't have all that happy news anymore, and. I don't know what to do with that. I don't want to disappoint people. I don't want people worrying about me. You know, in this, in this picture, many of you have symptoms much worse than mine. So who am I to complain? Anybody else? Oh. I cry a lot. You cry a lot? Over stuff that you know, I shouldn't really be crying about. So yeah, I know I'm depressed. And then it's admitting that you need help. Well, thank you. I appreciate you saying that because it is hard. Perhaps we could talk afterwards. Okay, so interventions, the reason why you're here. So getting the prefrontal cortex back online, that thinking part of the brain back online. The easy one is grounding, feeling your feet flat on the floor, feeling that sense. It's kind of like that wire that's attached to our house. I don't know if you know that wire, but... I, try, I almost took that wire off and my, my guy was like, no, 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 don't do that, leave it alone. This, we can ground ourselves too by just imagining. I've seen, there's someone online that says, oh my God, that's so ridiculous. 
you know what, I'm willing to pull on whatever I need to be able to help myself feel like I'm helping myself, you know? So if there's any reality to it, I'm okay with it. If there isn't any, I'm okay with it. So you might try grounding, which is to feel your feet flat on the floor. Um, sometimes people will say um, walking barefoot on grass or sand so that you feel that sense of being connected to nature. Um, sitting up straight, that was what Jack was talking about, about not leaning over and pinching off your diaphragm. Yes, sir. Yeah, I also find for me, I really pay attention to my breathing and really taste the breath that I'm taking in. It's really amazing. It's a really amazing sensation. And that helps to really get me centered. That's perfect. I so am happy to hear you say that because the more that you can stay with that, that's a meditative process. And that will help you lull to sleep. That will help you stay present in the doctor's office. Awesome. So I will also talk about some breathing techniques that most of you probably already know. So um, the one that seems to be the favorite um, that I've used in trainings here, but also um, we use it in, I was so happy when the cops said, oh yeah, I'm now using it on teenagers out on the street. So I'm gonna kind of model it here. So if we were using our feet, I'm gonna model as if I have bare feet up here. <clears throat> and it's scrunching your toes, left, right, left, right. It doesn't matter if it's right, left, it doesn't matter. It just matters that you're doing one and then the other. And what that does is it, your brain is forced to regulate your toes. So you can do it inside your shoes, I'm doing it right now. You can do it while you're sitting with your doctor. So just going like this, like this, like this, like this, and it will pull on your frontal lobes. Why it pulls on your frontal lobes is because the amygdala, the only part of the brain not connected to, the only part of the amygdala, however way it goes, the amygdala is not connected to the occipital lobes, which is the back part of the brain. The back part of the brain is for counting and organizing. So this goes back to third grade. Remember when they had green, be green beans and red beans and you had to separate them out and how many tens and how many three? That's what that was doing, was activating the occipital lobes. So the more that you can do those kind of activities, the better you're gonna do. Does that make sense to people? This is an easy technique to practice anywhere you want. You can do it in the, so what it is, is the more you practice it, then when you need it, it will be there for you. If you don't practice it, you're not building neural pathways to have it already exist for you. So um, I'm gonna ask you to do an experiment. So you can look around the colors. I want you to notice your vision right now. For those of you just looking around, Taking a moment. Okay, so now what I'm gonna ask you to do is I want you, you do it inside your own head, but say the word inside your own head. I want you to pick out three things that are green. So for example, the green necklace, the green on the skirt, the green on the wall. So you can do it for yourself. Now pick two things that are red. So look around, say to yourself, two things that are red. Now, one thing that's black. Now, look around at the same patterns that you were looking and notice if there's more of a sense of sharpness or acuity to your vision. Does it seem like it is? Because you're more aware now? What it is is we've pulled on that occipital lobe to override the amygdala and it pulls on the frontal lobes. So it's counting and organizing. So it doesn't matter what the colors are. So you could pick purple and pink and blue. It doesn't matter what the colors are. It's about going around going, okay, Jack's got a blue shirt on, the water label on the water bottle is blue, and the blue on the tile. Um, green would be the green necklace and the green on the pillow. And black would be Yasuwe's black outfit. So that pulled on my frontal lobes, that brought me back into the window of, of arousal or tolerance. 
this is what I'm doing in the doctor's office when I'm waiting. I'm doing all the little tricks so that I can feel like I'm totally present for whatever the news is. Any questions about that? Hi, Carol. All right. So those are the interventions. Breath work. So the breath work, okay, we talked about the clavicle breathing when it's up here. This is the most common thing that people do when they have anxiety disorders is they are breathing. They're, it's almost like they're little tiny rabbits. Hi, Carol. Um, little tiny rabbits when a dog is after a rabbit or a fox or whatever. Little rabbits kind of pull in and they stop breathing because they don't want anybody to see them, right? Well, we tend to do the same thing because we are much like social animals that I talked about yesterday. So that shallow breathing is going to activate the amygdala that's going to try to take this off to do the fight flight and freeze. Remember where it can get jacked up. You can look like you're fine on the outside, but inside you're like going, Ugh, right? So the more that we can do the deep breathing, so the first one, the easiest one is, and I'm going to model it, and then I'm going to ask us to do it, and we'll do it for five times, just because I want you to have the experience. So uh, it's called 422. It's take a deep breath. Hold it. One, two, three, four. Blow it halfway out with pursed lips. One, two. Hold it for two and blow it the rest of the way out. Yeah. So let's do it a second time. Take a deep breath. One, two, three, four. Blow it halfway out. One, two, hold it, two, and blow it out. Third time, take a deep breath. Hold it, one, two, three, four, halfway out. Hold it, one, two, the rest of the way. Number four, take a deep breath. Hold it, one, two, three, four, halfway out. Hold it the rest of the way. Last time, take a deep breath. Hold it, one, two, three, four, halfway out. One, two, the rest of the way. So like the acuity on the vision, can you feel like you have more energy in the body? I don't have any clinical reason to believe this, but oxygen, cancer doesn't like oxygen. So the more that we can do the breath, the more that we taste it, practice it, we're going to benefit from it. So the other really simple, it sounds complicated, don't worry about it, you will get it when you're able to practice it, is alternate nose breathing. A lot of people will do it in yoga, classes like that. I do it because I used to, when I was a young therapist, I had to do a lot of um, walking across streets to go see attorneys. I had an office downtown, but I did a lot of legal work for children. So I would go, blow it out, breathe it in, blow it out, breathe in. Blow it out, breathe in, blow it out, breathe in, blow it out, last one, breathe it in, blow it out. What do you notice? I always feel like I'm hyperventilating when I'm doing deep breathing exercises. Yeah, I got too much oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like it. Yeah. 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 yeah, it it actually will. Some people report feeling twingling, t twingling, tingling on their face, tingling across here, tingling on the top of their head, and tingling across the back. What it's doing is literally oxygenating your brain. So part of it is also it's kind of like I learned from a client one time that she was a very, um, she dealt a lot with anxiety through an eating disorder. And her anxiety, 
symptoms would, would be you know, feeling like she was really anxious and she couldn't breathe. But it also turned out the same thing was through excitement. Because at the end of her treatment, I had her play um, rummy cards, you know, a game of cards with me. And she was, she, you know, I, I build it up and we get all excited. And she was like, but I'm having an anxiety attack. And I said, no, no, no. You're equating the same symptoms as having anxiety that was also excitement. So it's how we're going to define it. Because, you know, one of the good things, and I know Carol knows this too, most of us don't die from having an anxiety attack. You know, most of us will just kind of fall into tears, fall on the floor, but we're able to stay present. We're not going to die. I don't know of anyone that's ever died of a panic attack. It's not a pleasant experience. I don't want to ever have it. I've been close, I think, a few times, but you know, get this diagnosis and you do. But that's why we're doing these things. And I hope that you have that experience of, oh, oxygen is actually what my cancer doesn't want. So I'm going to try doing a little bit more of that. How many already have done all of these breathing exercises? Most of you. How many have had panic attacks? Yeah. Having them. They're very scary. You do feel like you're going to die, but you yeah. don't feel like it. Yeah. Yeah. And so if you started to feel like you were going to, the very first thing that you can do, besides taking a good deep breath, is stand up because, and hold on to something at the same time. Mm -hmm. Because when you stand up, it's called orthostatic hypotension. You can faint because you're starting to get all excited and the interpretation of whatever the symptoms are. So hold on to the counter, hold on to the desk, hold on to the chair, but stand up because what you're wanting to do is change what is literally going on in your circulation of your system. The body really is our friend. You know, we have some errant, you know, I want to say errant cells that have become too good at their job and we want to get rid of those cells, but it's not our enemy. And I know that this has been one of my pieces to work with because I've been an athlete most of my adult life. I've been a vegetarian for four decades and I really specialized in how to take care of myself and how could this happen, you know? It's like, what? But then what's the point of going down that lane? I got it. You just got to deal with it. Okay, so um, progressive muscle relaxation. Can you go like this and say, show me anybody that has not ever had progressive muscle relaxation? Okay. All right, then I'll go ahead and do it. We'll do it together, actually, or I'll just model it in front. Because this is, again, something that you can practice laying down. My husband was like, no, tell them. They can do it anywhere. They can do it in an airplane seat. They can do a waiting in a line at a grocery store. Because this is about moving the tension out of the muscles and increasing circulation. And cancer doesn't like it. So you can tighten up your feet. Tight, 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 tight. Let go, tighten them up, let go, tighten up your calves, tight, 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 without tightening up your feet, tight, 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 yeah, that tennis playing. Let go, tighten it up, let go, tighten up your thighs, let go, tighten them up. Let go, tighten up your buttocks, let go, tighten them up, let go, tighten up your abdomen, let go, tighten it up. You're supposed to be breathing, right? Not holding your breath in. Right, like I am. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are breathing at the same time. So, and then you're going up to your abdomen, your upper back, your arms, I just got the five minute notice. The hands and then the fight, the flat face. The children love this. We teach this in kindergarten now so that the children know how to be able to do this because it's a way to learn how to be staying in your body. So I have one real quick story I want to tell you because it's, I have two stories, but a five minute warning. It's like, okay. Okay, all right. So you have the list about walking, you know, go to places that make you feel good. I've already made that list. So the bus story. 
So the bus story is about a family, and I'm just going to make it very short. It's about a family where everybody in this family was born believing of their family culture that every time a bus came by, they needed to get on the bus. <laughs> and the bus would take them all over the place, and they would wind up, you know, miles from home in the nighttime because that's where that bus went. And they would always be frustrated, and they'd be spending their money, and they didn't understand what was going on. And one day, this young lady was approached by this man, and he said, why are you always getting on the bus? I see you at the bus stops all over town, and you don't look very happy. And she was like, what do you mean? This is what my family does. And he says, look, buses are not for that purpose. Buses are to take you from here to the place that you want to go. And she was like, oh, you're the crazy one. I'm leaving. So she goes on the next bus as it comes up. And she looks out the window, and she's realizing how tired she is. And she looks out the window, and she sees all these people sitting around and talking and laughing. And she doesn't feel that way. And she doesn't understand what's going on. So the next morning, she sits at the bus stop, and she looks all around, makes sure none of her family are around. So she stays, and the bus comes, and she lets it go on. And she watched the next bus come up, and she let it go on. And she saw the third bus come, and she goes, you know, that's going where I want to go. So she got on the bus, and she realized that she didn't feel as tense. She had a little more money because she hadn't gone on those first two buses. She got to her destination, and she started realizing, oh, I don't have to get on every single bus. I can do exactly what that man told me to do. I can take the bus where it's going, only for that purpose. I'll have more money, I'll be happier. So the whole point of this very fast forward story is it, uh, the bus is much like our thoughts. And I talked yesterday about not taking, we don't have to believe every single thought process we have. Not all of our thoughts are the truth. And we want to learn how to control how we're reacting to those thoughts. So having said that, I won't even do a check-in. Here's the other story I really wanted to do yesterday, and I missed it. So this is about fear. So there's a samurai. This is a samurai who, you know, samurais are trained, very disciplined. And he wants to go see the monk. What? The monk. You know, the monk's sitting up in the mountain. He's up there. He's meditating. He's doing his drill. He's probably doing this nice deep breathing. And the samurai goes, he climbs up the mountain, he goes, Monk, I want to talk to you. And, you know, the samurai is used to having obedience. And he says, teach me about heaven and hell. He's barking this out. Monk looks up and he goes, I have nothing to say to you. I have utter disdain of you. You are not teachable at all. What a waste of my time. How dare you come and interrupt me? Samurai is so angry, pulls out his sword, and he's ready to go at the monk. And the monk looks up at him, and he realizes in the look of the monk's eyes the compassion that he has for this samurai. And the samurai lowers his sword I'm getting chills. And he looks at him and he goes, I am so sorry, monk. And the monk looks back at him and he says, that was hell and this is heaven. Wow. Isn't that powerful? Yes. Yeah. That's the same for us. <laughs> I got the chills. Yeah. We have, you know, hubby said, don't say this. I think that what is happening for all of us with this ocular melanoma is that we are on a path that we don't want to be on. We can choose to fight it and create a lot of stories, or we can choose to reach out for the help and support that we need, both from peers, from the physicians, of course, and from each other that can help support us through this path. I gave you some tools today to be able to 
try working with your window of arousal. And I'm really hoping that this was helpful. One thing to remember about the window of arousal is that it is purely neurological. That's what I liked so much about this, this um, model, is that there's nothing wrong with me. My anxiety goes up based on my sympathetic nervous system response. Or the parasympathetic goes down because I'm too slow. It's not anything to do with my character. There's nothing wrong with me, psychologically speaking. Well, some people might differ, but, <laughs> you know, let me just make sure that I've covered everything that I said I was going to cover. The, the final part is going back to the first page. The literature cannot say it enough. It's popular everywhere we look. Doing daily gratitude and doing daily thankfulness. I, I couldn't believe it. I was looking over my notes, and on Thanksgiving Day, I turned on the news, and there it was. Very same thing. They were talking about it. I guess the new stuff coming out on all the popular books is on about gratitude and about thankfulness. Of course, it was on Thanksgiving, so that counts. On the calendar, when you're getting ready for your scan, write in your calendar. You know when your next scans are. So two weeks before my scans, I write down extra time for me to do acupuncture, extra sessions, to make sure that I have dates with my girlfriends so that we're getting together and just going for walks, shooting the breeze, doesn't cost anything. But what it does is it helps me feel like I've got my whole committee going into that scan with me. So that when I'm laying in that machine, I'm not alone. So make lists. I have to make lists because my, my brain is like a sieve. I say I'm going to remember something, and you wanted me to answer the question about integrative oncology. Integrative, that I'll give a little definition of what I understand. Integrative oncology practices Eastern and Western medicine. I need to have, uh, so allopathic medicine is what we're doing with our doctors, you know, the traditional medical approach that we diagnose and then we treat with, and then alternative medicine is acupuncture, Ayurvedic diet, things like that. But it's clinically proven to be of support for people with cancer. It's not what I was talking about, about, oh, let's go see the psychic. No. And so, again, on Facebook, I see a lot of stuff going around that says, well, just try turmeric, or let's try the Gerson therapy, or let's do this. This is your path. Get the education that you need to make informed decisions. There are good websites. Uh, MD Anderson has a really good um, integrative oncology website that was user friendly that I could actually access. The one for New York, I had more of a trouble trying to get the information that I wanted. Are there any questions? So you, you were going to ask me something in, in addition. Where do you find uh, integrative? So uh, look on MD Anderson on their website, www.md Anderson, because they will give you articles and they'll make uh, uh, suggestions of what you can do. And they've got lots of videos. Okay. So, That's good. Yes, Carol. Your, your voice is meditative for me. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. Thank you all. I want to say thank you to Jack. I want to say thank you to our Cure Insight. And I want to say thank you for all of you for your spending time with me. I really appreciate it. I genuinely do. This is our path together. And we're not alone. Blessings to all of us. Thank you.